Hi, today is the second video in our series on thermonuclear fusion. A couple of months ago, we put out the first video where I discussed fusion, the principles behind fusion, as well as some of the properties of the burning plasmas that are the core of what is going to be controlled thermonuclear fusion in the near future. In addition to that, I also went through some of the laboratory tricks and techniques that would allow you to generate a plasma at home, the vacuum techniques and technology and the high voltage. Because the temperature of a burning plasma is upwards of 150 million degrees, no physical material can contain that plasma without either being destroyed or, in turn, cooling the plasma and stopping the reaction. And so, as a result, the only way that we can contain that plasma is to take advantage of the fact that the deuterium and the tritium nuclei and the resulting helium nuclei, otherwise known as alpha particles, are charged. So a powerful magnetic field can manipulate as well as contain the plasma without it ever physically contacting any, any solid materials. So today what I'm going to talk about is some of the principles behind what generates and what manipulates magnetic fields and how they interact with matter. Now the simplest charged particle is an electron. And an electron can be associated with a magnetic field in a couple of ways. First, it has its own magnetic field. It's actually like a tiny little bar magnet with an orientation, a north and south. And that orientation can be flipped. It actually has a up or down, or essentially a north or a south, and it's called spin. And in addition to that magnetic field, which is always associated with the electron, as the electron moves through space, in this example, in the direction of my right-hand thumb, there is a field distortion in space associated with that motion that follows the direction of my right-hand fingers. It's called the right-hand rule. And that orientation doesn't mean that the field lines or the field is spinning around the direction of motion. It just simply has a, an orientation that is unique. Just like, for example, in chemistry, they call that chirality or mirror image, or in a shop, that would be the same thing as a left and a right hand thread on a screw. It's not actually spinning or moving, but it's unique, just like my hands. You can't interchange the left and right hand. You will always be able to identify them. And so because of the right hand rule, depending on the orientation or the direction of motion, we will get a field direction that corresponds to the direction of the motion of the electron. And that motion of the electron will distort the field in space around the motion of the electron. So if we put a detector and pass the detector with the electron, we will detect a change in the magnetic field due to its passage. And the direction of that change will be associated with the direction of the motion of the electron. That is related to uh, the motion, not the spin. We'll get into the spin in a second. Now, when physical materials interact, like if you take a, a nail and a hammer and you slam onto the nail, the atoms in the hammer and the nail don't actually physically contact. It is the interaction of the fields that produce the force that drives the nail. So the forces can be very, very great. They can be tremendous. And so rather than speaking physically, what I'm going to show you in this little apparatus here is that depending on the direction of the field, these fields can interact with each other and either attract the electrons associated with them and the macroscopic materials that contain the electrons can be attracted because the electrons are attracted because the fields are attracted. Or conversely, they can oppose or they can resist or repel each other. So in this apparatus, what I have is a variac or a voltage controlled uh, transformer hooked up to a high voltage uh, power supply, which charges a capacitor bank. And I have a little trigger switch here which will close an SCR, or silicon controlled rectifier. Basically, it's a high current, very rapid solid state switch. When I hit this switch, I can dump all of the power of this capacitor bank in about one millisecond, 
and produce as much as 15,000 amps in a very short period of time, and that power will travel through these two conductors. The way I have this wired right now is that the positive of the capacitors is hooked up to the top of these two conductors, and because of this conductive wire here, the uh, rods here will experience the same polarity. They'll have the same positive voltage at this end. At the other end, I have both of these ends of the rods hooked up through the SCR down to ground. So when I close the switch, the electrons will flow out of ground through the switch, through these rods in the same direction, and then up to the positive end of the capacitor where they will fill the, the electron deficit of the capacitor and basically discharge it. So in this case, because the electrons are coming up this way, the field direction associated with my right hand will be in the same direction in both rods. And therefore, the two fields will interact cooperatively to cause the rods to move together. So let me go ahead and charge this up, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge this up to about 120 volts. 10, 20, 100, and on 3. 1, 2, Three. See? They're attracted to each other. Now what I'm going to do is rewire this. Now you can see I've got the ground side hooked up to this end of this rod, takes a loop over here and goes down this rod to the high voltage side of the capacitor. So the electrons are going up in this rod and they are going down in this rod and so the electric fields are now opposing each other and so they should move apart. So let's charge this up. All right, on three. One, two, three. See, they move apart. So now, what this is actually demonstrating is what's called zeta pinch, or z-axis pinch. Effectively, when the electrons in a plasma or in an electron beam are all traveling in the same direction, they're generating magnetic fields that are all cooperative. The consequence is that the beam tends to constrict itself. It tends to become narrow. That's why lightning and spark discharges don't tend to just be balls of repulsive electrons. They tend to gather, they tend to tighten into a tiny, thin streamer. And that is the result of zeta pinch. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about spin. Now let's look at spin. Basically, as I said before, the electron has a polarity to it, just like a little bar magnet. But the effect, uh, macroscopically, of a magnet on most materials is not detectable because the trillions of atoms inside this bench, inside of the main presenter, this plastic electron, are all randomly oriented. So even though the electrons, some of them may attract a magnet and some may repel net-net, there's really no effect on these macroscopic objects because of the random orientation of the spin of the electrons that make up the material. Now, certain materials, ferromagnetic materials, like the metal inside of this pliers, do have the ability to flip their spins in response to a magnetic field. So, for example, if I take this magnet to the pliers, you can see that it's attracting the plier. Even though the plier is not magnetic, and even though the plier itself has a random orientation of electron spins before the field of the electron gets near it. As soon as the influence of that field gets near those electrons, the iron allows those electron spins to all line up in the same direction and effectively north to south attract the magnet. When I remove the magnet, effectively most of these spins are allowed to randomize again. So if I reverse the direction of the magnet, it still attracts because they reorient in the opposite direction and I produce the same sort of attractive force. Now, what's kind of interesting about this, though, is that not every single one of those electrons that realign when I reverse the magnet actually free up when I move the magnet away and re remove the magnetic field. And so if you take a look down here on the bench, I have another piece of iron in this little tool, and I have a little nail here. And if you see, the iron here, the metal here, does not attract the nail. But if I take that same magnet and I put it on the end of this tool, like this, 
Now when I take this tool and put it by the nail, it attracts it. Not 100% of all of the electron spins in this ferromagnetic material are able, are free to re-randomize. A few of them stay oriented according to that magnetic field. This is important if you've ever worked in a shop. This can be a real hassle. And so they actually make devices, electronic devices, that will demagnetize tools. Because as you can imagine, if all the tools, wrenches, bits, and, and milling machine equipment are magnetized, they will attract metal chips, they will pull screws out of holes that you're trying to assemble items out of. And so as a consequence, this is not a useful magnetization. However, if we want to produce a permanent magnet, a strong magnet, if we take certain materials, ceramics, like neodymium boron, comes like a ceramic powder, and we put it into a mold, and then we bring it up to a very high temperature and a very high pressure, we sinter it into a macroscopic precursor of a bar magnet. When we then place a very powerful magnetic field, usually an electronic or electromagnetic pulse, that creates a very strong magnetic field momentarily, it will align all of the spins of the material inside of the magnet, and when we remove the field, this remains oriented. As a result, it's permanently magnetized, a permanent magnet. Now, if you look over here, I have another little example of a permanent magnet. Now, what I have here, if you, I'll tip this over so that you can see what I'm talking about. I have a ring-shaped magnet. This is an N52 neodymium boron high strength magnet, but it's in the shape of a ring. And the field associated with this ring is in the shape of a donut. Mathematically, it's called a toroid. And when you hear about people talking about fusion reactors, they call them tokamaks. And it's a word that's based on a Russian uh, term, acronym. And the T in the tokamak stands for toroidal. That is the shape of the magnetic containment bottle inside of a nuclear reactor. In this case, because we have a toroidal magnetic field, but it is permanent, it's stable, it's not changing. If we take a small coil of wire and we lay it on top of here, and don't move anything, and you look here, you'll see that we're not generating any kind of a current, because basically there's no work being done on the electrons inside of that coil. But if I take that coil, watch the meter, and I raise it up, you can see I get a voltage. And if I lower it down, you can see I get a voltage, but only during the motion. And depending on how I have this oriented, that little dot on this cheap meter represents a negative. So you can see in one direction, I have one polarity. In the other direction, I have the other polarity. The idea being that when an electron moves through space, it generates a distortion a moving distortion in the field associated with it. Conversely, if you take an electron and you create a moving magnetic or a distortion of a magnetic field around the electron, you will move it. So, and a lot of this uh, sort of understanding of electrons and electron fields and any kind of a charged particle and a magnetic field, there's always two ways to look at it. There's a cause and effect and an effect and a cause. So in this case, because I'm generating energy, Essentially, I'm doing some work in order to create the current that you read on the meter. If I had very, very sensitive hands when I moved this up and I moved it down, I'd actually be able to detect a slight force, a resistance to my motion. Has to, because I can't create energy out of nothing, so I have to be doing work on this. The problem is my hands aren't sensitive enough, so I can't feel the resistance of the wire to the motion that I'm creating here. But we are clearly producing a current. Now what's interesting though is we can scale this up to the point that you can actually see the effect of the force created by the counteracting field. And I'll show you that over here. Okay, now I have another magnet over here. Same sort of toroidal field, but it has a much smaller hole. And I have, like the loop, a conductor. But in this case, the conductor is a hollow aluminum tube. Effectively, it accomplishes the same thing. When I take this aluminum conductor and I pass it through a magnetic field, I'll generate a current in the conductor. The current that's generated by a field will itself produce a field, moving electrons. And those fields will always oppose each other. That's the only way that you can create work when you're moving the 
the electrons through the field. And in fact, if it didn't, it would end the universe because effectively we would essentially be reversing entropy. We would be creating energy from nothing. We have to do work to get energy or elect electrical power out and we have to use energy in order to create force or work. So when I place this tube into this device, you're going to see a difference in the fall rate. Right now it's falling at 1G or 10 meters per second per second or 32 feet per second per second. If I put it inside of this ring and drop it, you can see how much more slowly it falls because of the current that's generated in the conductor that opposes the field that produced the current. So it drops much more slowly. Now if we come over here, I'm going to show you something interesting. This is a little scale. And if we take this aluminum tube and we place it in onto the scale, you'll see that it weighs about 15 grams. Now if I take a similar sized stainless steel tube, denser, you'll see that it weighs about 45 grams. And if I take a similar sized copper tube and I weigh it here, you'll see that it weighs slightly more but close to 45 grams, 47 grams. Now if I take these three tubes, and once again, this is the aluminum. You saw how slow that was. I'll do it one more time. Now I take the stainless steel, three times heavier, and I drop it through here. It's almost unaffected, or the slowing is so small that it's difficult to even see it. Now you might think, okay, that's because it's heavier, right? Yeah, it is to some extent because it's heavier. However, remember the copper was even heavier than the stainless steel. And if we put it in here, you'll notice that it does slow down. Not as much as the aluminum because it still is much heavier, but it's much slower than the stainless steel. That's because the copper has such a high electrical conductivity that the same amount of work will generate a larger current, more electrons, and a greater opposing field when we drop this through here. Now, an interesting thing is, what if we could produce an even higher electrical conductivity? So I have here some liquid nitrogen, and I have two identical aluminum tubes. I'm going to put one in the liquid nitrogen, and we're going to cool it off. Kind of exciting. Now remember how slowly this dropped. Let's count it on three. One, two, three. 1,001. About one second, roughly. Now if I take this, aluminum is now about three times more conductive than it is at room temperature. And we'll put it in here and we'll count. Ready? One, one, two, three, four. Slower. It's the same tube. It's the same weight. But the conductivity is higher, so the drop rate is slower because the current is greater. You can imagine what would happen if we put a superconductor in here. Now, that's kind of neat, but what I want to do now is, as the oracle told Neo in The Matrix, oh, what's really going to bake your noodle later on is... What happens if I take that same aluminum rod that I had here and I cut it? So basically, I eliminate the ability of it to conduct a current around in a circle like this. Theoretically, if it slowed down with the aluminum, like this, this shouldn't work because I don't have a complete conductive circuit. And if you look, it still slows it down. Not quite as much, but it's definitely working. The reason that is, is because some of the current goes all the way around, but the majority of the current actually follows very tiny nanoscale orbitals. They're called gyro orbitals, or gyro radii. And the reason this is important is because that occurs within the entire mass of the material. And when building thermonuclear fusion reactors, the importance of the intensity of the magnetic field is not just linear. So if we can increase the magnetic field strength by, say, a factor of two, we can improve the containment of the plasma, not only because we can keep everything farther away from the walls, but because the tiny little nuclei, the positively charged nuclei, 
are whipping around inside of this toroidal field, there are small perturbations that can occur, little variations in temperature, little variations in pressure, which can cause those orbitals not to follow a very nice orbit around the minor axis of the, of the toroid, but they can begin to oscillate and they can begin to follow pathways that will eventually carry them into the walls and essentially remove them from the reaction. The more tightly those orbitals wrap around those field lines, those little tiny spirals forming a little tiny spiral as it moves through, the more resistant those nuclei are to what are called MHD or magnetohydrodynamic perturbations or instabilities. It's one of the big banes of these reactors is to keep those unstable orbitals from building up to the point that they break down. Consequently, a stronger magnetic field affects the size, the containment of the, of the fusion reactor, not linearly, but like the third power. Double the field and we can increase containment, reduce the size, reduce the cost, and speed up the, uh, the development of these reactors many, many fold. And that's why magnetic fields are so critical. So now let's kick this up about three orders of magnitude. Let me show you something interesting. A couple of minutes ago, I showed you the effects of zeta pinch, or when charged particles, whether they're electrons or positively charged nuclei, are traveling in the same direction, they tend to pull together and concentrate the, the energy. This is called a theta pinch machine, and basically it's going to demonstrate the force that can be generated by opposing fields from a conductor with a rapidly changing field and a conductor that experiences that effect of that rapidly changing field. It's otherwise known as a can crusher, kind of a neat device. Now the setup here is pretty simple. Again, a variac will give us a variable voltage input to a high voltage power supply. This power supply will then charge these pulse capacitors. These are a little different than the electrolytics we used in the other example because these are designed with a very low self-inductance, and so therefore they can discharge all of their power in about a microsecond instead of about a millisecond, so they can produce much higher peak currents. And because of the fact that these things generate such a high peak current, we can't use the SCR, the solid state switch that we used in the previous experiment. We have to use what's called a spark gap. Very simple device though. Two tungsten electrodes are held in clamps on either end, and are separated in the center by about a one millimeter gap. That gap contains air, and that air is a sufficient insulator so that the 2,000 volts or so that I'm gonna put across here cannot jump that gap. But when I take a 40,000 volt pulse from this device here and send it to the center section here, I create a corona discharge, essentially an ionization of the air inside of that gap. As a result, the resistance goes down, the insulating property of the air goes down, and now the electrons from the capacitor can jump the gap in an arc or a spark and effectively conduct the electricity through the loop and back into the capacitor. This can switch much higher currents, and it actually has a switching time that's measured down in the nanoseconds. So this device is what we're gonna be using to switch this. Now on the meter over there, I've got this hooked onto the capacitors and the ground through what's called a voltage divider. So effectively what you read on the meter is one-tenth of the actual voltage across here because this can't read 2,000 volts. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug this on, I'm gonna plug this in, we'll start ramping up the voltage, and then when I get close to the point that we're gonna fire it, I think anybody with headphones is gonna to wanna to turn them down because this can be a little bit loud. So let's put on a little safety equipment and plug it in we're going to be looking for about 200 volts across the meter. Here we go. 1,000 volts. 1,500. All right. On three, two, one. Whoa. Now, what's interesting about this is you can see that the can has been crushed all the way around its periphery. And in some, it's even a little warm, 
And you can see on some uh, YouTube videos where they'll explain how this happens and they'll explain that the current in the can actually causes the can to crush itself. That's not actually true because the high voltage or the high current field, the high field, maybe five, six Tesla that's built up inside this coil is sufficiently strong and rapidly changing enough that the current inside the can can reach 10, 20,000 amps. Because of that very high uh, current, we get a very high field in the can. And as I explained when I showed the counter current flow of electricity in those two rods, the opposite sides of this can have current traveling in opposite directions. So if the can were in isolation and we could get that kind of current into it, it would actually explode rather than contract. The reason the can is crushed is it's crushed by the field of the coil. The coil is crushing the can. And because the coil is much stronger than the can, that's why it induces this crush. And because the coil is much closer to the wall of the can than the opposite wall of the can, that's why the net force is a crushing force. The reason this is so important has to do with modern superconductors. The limitation on the ability to produce a successful thermonuclear reactor is really limited by the fields that we can produce. And typically for many decades, they've been depending on conventional superconductors, neodymium or uh, niobium tin. And the problem with that kind of a superconductor is that there are two things that will cause a superconductor to fail to superconduct. One is obviously temperature above what's called the critical temperature, these virtual entities called Cooper pairs or essentially pairs of electrons that form an electron wave through the conductor allow for that lossless, resistanceless conduction. And when you go above a certain temperature, the thermal vibrations or phonons will cause those Cooper pairs to break up and you now have a conventional conductor. That's pretty well known because you know it's a low temperature superconductor. But there's another property that will cause a superconductor to fail to superconduct, and that is the magnetic field in which it's immersed. Inside of a superconductor, there are very tiny little defects in its superconductivity process. And these tiny little magnetic vortices that are present inside the conductor can disrupt those Cooper pairs. But the point is they're so small and they're so weak that as long as they remain separated, they're not enough to break up the pairs and stop the superconductive activity. However, those little tiny vortices, those little tornadoes can move around and they can coalesce into larger vortices, which in fact can stop the superconductive process. The rare earth, yttrium, which is the most common of the REBCO, rare earth barium copper oxide material, this. The yttrium tends to pin those micro vortices and keep them from moving around. And so you can immerse a high temperature superconductor like these Rebco tapes in a far higher field before it will fail to operate. And the field that you can reach is enormously higher than the field in a conventional superconductor. Just to give you an idea of what kind of forces we're talking about. Clearly, with this system here, I was producing some pretty significant forces. But when you take a tape like this and you wrap it up into a coil with thousands of wraps, 90 to 95% of all the material inside of this is not the copper layer that you see on the outside. And it's not the one micron thick of superconductor that's conducting about a mega amp per square centimeter. It's a high tensile strength stainless steel or hastaloy. And when you wrap this up and form a disc, you may have several centimeters of thickness in this coil. And the fields that can be produced are so great that sometimes before the superconductor fails to superconduct, the entire coil will explode. So you can imagine the kind of forces you're talking about, enormous. The world's highest superconductive magnetic field was recently produced with one of these coils and reached 45 Tesla. That's about four times as high as the design fields that are anticipated or needed in the ITER reactor that's located in France. This enormous, monstrous, industrial park size machine requires this huge size because of its weak magnetic fields. The only way to keep the, the hot plasma from the walls is simply make it so large that it takes a very long time for the 
lone stray random nuclei to be able to touch the wall and effectively leave the reaction. As the magnetic field increases, the size of the machine decreases by the third power. So if you can double the magnetic field, you can reduce the size of the device by a factor of eight. If you can triple it 27 times, if you can quadruple it, you can imagine. So you move from industrial size machine, I mean, industrial park size machines, you know, airport hangar size machines to something that might even fit in this room. That's why this whole concept of thermonuclear fusion in the near term has become achievable. That's why it's so exciting. This is really going to happen. So now that I've shown you with the solid materials, let me show you what happens with a magnetic field when we interact with plasma. Okay, so now what I have right here is the setup for the plasma tube. And if you want the details of how exactly this is put together and how to operate it, take a look at the previous video because I go into a lot of details. Today what I'm going to do though is a slight variation between last time and this time because so many people in the comments section said, hey, we want to see a whole bunch of different kinds of gases and different color discharges. And so what I decided to do is to do a discharge rather than in a typical gas, to do it in a mercury gas or a mercury vapor. The reason that's significant is because that's what drives all fluorescent tubes. Mercury is a remarkable material in that it's one of the most efficient generators of light per watt in existence, including LEDs. And the only downside is that most of that energy that it produces is produced around 250 nanometers in the UV. You can't see it. So what they do is they coat the inside of the tube where the UV can contact the phosphor. And the phosphor then glows the bright white uh, driven by the UV from the, the ultraviolet light. Actually, that's what also makes LED lights white because the gallium nitride diode that's producing the light actually is a deep blue color. And it drives phosphor on the surface of the LED to produce the white light. So in this case, what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hook up the vacuum pump. I'm going to turn it on and begin drawing this down. Then I'm going to flush this with a little buffer argon to get rid of any air and any water. And then as the mercury evaporates under the low pressure, you'll begin to see the bright blue discharge. Because this is a quartz tube, the UV can get out. So I'm going to be wearing some safety goggles when this is on. And the other thing I just want to mention here is the cold trap. This is our liquid nitrogen doer. And the reason I have this on this cold trap is because I don't want the mercury vapor to get into the air. Even though we have an activated carbon filter on the output from the pump, I'd rather not contaminate the inside of the pump and the oil with the mercury vapor. So by passing it through into this cold chamber or into this uh, cold trap that has a little molecular sieve at the bottom of it and run it down at liquid nitrogen temperature, all that mercury will uh, adhere to the surface of the the molecular sieve. And then when we're done, I can simply dump this out in a disposal receptacle and keep it out of the air. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the pump and we'll get the pump, the pressure down in the tube. So we'll turn on the pump. And then I'm going to open the valve that allows the air to be drawn out of the tube. You'll hear the different sound in the pump. Then I'm going to go ahead and open the argon and let a little argon flush through here so that we can get rid of the nitrogen and the water vapor. And we'll let that go for a few seconds. Then I'm going to go ahead and plug in the power supply and run this up to about 2,000 volts. We'll see what it looks like. Now you don't see anything right now simply because I have a high enough pressure of argon that it's acting as an insulator. So when I turn the argon off and the pressure goes down, we'll start to see the discharge. Let's go ahead and turn this down and see what we see. See the bright blue discharge? I can even smell a faint aroma of ozone because the UV is actually able to create ozone and that's what you use in some ozone generators is a low pressure mercury vapor lamp. Now one of the things that you'll notice here as the electrons are traveling through this tube moving from the cathode to the anode end, they pass through this area here where I have that toroidal or ring shaped magnet. And if you look carefully, you can see how the shape of the column of mercury changes because of the magnet. What that's doing is essentially creating a theta pinch. The mercury vapor is actually being pulled or 
uh, pushed away from the edges of the magnet where the field is strongest and trying to find a narrow spot in the middle as far as it can get away from the magnet. But in addition, it's also the fact that the current that's caused inside of the moving electrons, inside the beam of moving electrons, creates a counter magnetic field which opposes the magnetic field that generates that. And so therefore, you get a constriction, just like you got with the can crusher. Now over here, I have a coil. And this coil is simply a hundred, couple hundred wraps of a 16 gauge copper coil. And what's interesting about this is in order to generate a similar kind of constriction, a similar theta pinch, I have to run about two kilowatts through this coil. And you'll see how it compares to what's about a half Tesla field from this permanent magnet. So I'm gonna connect this up here to the power supply that we use for our old electric jet. And it's off right now, or it should be, and there's no power going through here. I can only run this for about three seconds before it becomes too hot because we're gonna put about 2,000 watts through here. You'll see on the meter the gauges, and what you're gonna look at is the sum of the two amp readings that happen when I turn this on. This you'll see on the inset inside the video, but what you'll also see from the uh, camera position is what happens to the column of electrons and the stimulated ions inside of that coil, the first coil, and then you can compare that to what happens inside the permanent magnet. So on the count of three, I'm gonna turn this on and you'll see what happens. One, two, three. See how it constricted it? I'll do it again. One, two, three. Now that magnet's already probably too hot to touch. And the significance of this is that clearly, if I've only got about a half a Tesla field in here, and it takes me 2,000 watts to not even equal the constricting effect, the controlling effect this has over the electrons and the ions, you can imagine that there is no conceivable way with a thermonuclear reactor that you could run with anything other than superconductors. It would be, you'd use all the power you produced and then some to just try to constrict the plasma. So superconductivity is the only way to go. This is a nice setup uh, using the, the mercury because it's so bright that even though it's a bright day outside, you can see a pretty nice column of light here. Now, what we're going to do in subsequent videos is we're going to talk a little bit more about the superconductivity process. And in addition, I'm going to see if I can get some arrangement, if possible, to interview some of the people that are involved in the active programs that are working on thermonuclear fusion. There's a very active group down at MIT, not that far from here. And if we can make some sort of a connection with them, I think it might be interesting to see what they can show us. The reason I've got some doubts about this is because they are moving so fast and they are so close, I think, to some pretty significant breakthroughs that they are commercially funded. They've actually got some power companies that are providing the funding and, using, and some of the commercial scientists are actually working with the MIT group. So they're very proprietary and somewhat uh, close-mouthed about the development simply because there's a lot of patents that are going to be coming out of this. But if we can get an interview with them, I think it would be very exciting because what they're doing is really, really exciting. So I hope you enjoyed the video and we're going to be getting on to some other topics and hopefully reviewing some of the topics that people have been missing follow-ups on over the last year or so. But this was exciting. The potential of thermonuclear fusion is really exciting. And I want to thank you very much for watching. If you like the kind of material on the channel, please subscribe. I read all the comments. And if you have questions or you want to make suggestions, I'll answer as many of them as I can. And most importantly, if you think that what we're doing here is valuable, it's educational, it's interesting, it's fun, please tell people because spreading the word about the channel really is more valuable to us than anything because it helps to extend our reach and helps us to spend our time and give more people more information. So I want to thank you very much for watching. You have a wonderful day. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.